So Django 5.2 is now out and in this video we're going to look at some of the new features in the release. And these features include the auto import of your Django models into the shell, the ability to define a composite primary key and simplified overriding of bound fields in Django form fields. And we'll also briefly look at some form widgets as well that have been added as well as some new minor features as well. Now before we get started, if you want to support the channel and you're enjoying this content, check out the coffee page that we've got in the description and hit the like button if you're finding this content useful. Now we did a video on Django 5.1 release. I'll leave a link to that below the video as well. This is about 5.2, which was released on April 2nd, 2025. And we're gonna look at some practical examples in this video of some of these new features. Now one of them is the automatic model imports in the shell. Now if you didn't know Django has a shell command, you can get that with manage.py shell. And we're gonna look at an example of that just now. So I'm gonna open up VS Code. And by the way, if you want to upgrade Django, you can run this command here, pip install and then the dash U flag, and then Django and any other packages you want to upgrade after that flag. Now once we've done that, we can run python manage.py and I'm going to run the shell command here. And notice at the top of this, we have seven objects imported automatically. Now I'm gonna to go to the models.py file in this project and we have a model here called contact. And notice if we reference that model, it's been auto imported. We can reference that here and we can execute queries. For example, get all of the contacts from the database. And at the moment we don't have any. So this is a super simple update, but it's really useful because when you're using the shell, chances are you're going to be bringing in your models and you might bring in things from other parts of your application, but models are probably the most common and they are now auto imported into this shell. So that's an example of something really simple but really useful that Django has added. Previously, if you wanted to achieve this, you might have to install Django extensions, for example, and that comes with a shell plus command that auto imports a bunch of stuff. We no longer need to rely on that package now for the models though, and that is super useful. So that's a simple change. I'm going to exit out of the shell just now, and we're gonna look at the second feature, which is composite primary keys. So let's go back to the Django documentation and go to the composite primary keys section. I'll leave a link to this page below the video. Now, essentially what this allows you to do is create tables that have a primary key that consists of multiple fields. So if you know about primary keys, they identify a row or an instance or an entity in a table. And usually that's an ID, whether it's a number or a UUID, but sometimes you need to model your data using other techniques. Now databases like Postgres and MySQL, they will allow you to create a composite primary key. And that consists of multiple columns in the table that can be used to uniquely identify the record. Now let's look at an example and there's one here with a release model. And notice that that model has two fields here, a version field, which is an integer, and a name field, which is a car field. Now the composite primary key is defined like this. We have the models.composite primary key object and we pass the names of the fields we want to use as part of that composite primary key. So the idea here is that we can't uniquely identify a release from the version number itself nor can we do it from just the name, but that combination of version and name should be able to uniquely identify a given release. Now I want to look at a simple example here and we're just going to use this release model example. So let's go to models.py and paste that in and notice we're defining that composite primary key. What we're now going to do is run the make migrations command. So that's python manage.py make migrations. And once we've done that, we can run the migrates command to make that change to the database. Now what's actually happened here, I'm gonna bring back the sidebar and we're gonna look at the database itself using the SQLite VS Code extension. So if we go to this SQLite Explorer here, and we're gonna look at the table. So it was the core release table here. And notice there's two columns, version and name, and they both have that key next to them. And that indicates that both of these columns form a composite primary key for this table. Now, if we look at the contact table, notice only the ID has that key. So that's a normal primary key if you want to call it that. Whereas this is a composite primary key in the release table. So that's how that works in SQLite. What I'm gonna do now is show how we can query the release model here using that composite primary key. So again, let's run the shell command here. And as before, if we look at the release model here, it's automatically imported. Now the release has a version and a name. So I'm gonna paste in a query here. We've got release.objects.create and we're passing a name of release one and a version of one into that. And it creates that object and it stores it in the database. Now notice this object string representation here. The primary key is a tuple and that consists of all of the fields in that composite primary key. Now we could run this query again and change the version number to two and that's gonna work fine but we cannot run the same query here. In other words, we cannot insert this data twice. So if we try and run that with release one and version two here, we're going to get a problem and that's because that primary key cannot be duplicated. So we've got a unique constraint failing here and that makes sense if you think of the IDs that Django normally uses, you can't insert a record 
that has an ID that already exists in the table and that works the same way for the composite primary key as well. Now I want to show this representation so we're going to pull the record out so release.objects.last that's going to give us the last record inserted into the table and if we look at that we can see it here. Now we can see the tuple in the string representation here but if I look at the .pk property that is actually represented as a tuple here so we can get each component or each element from the primary key using that .pk property. And what if we wanted to filter these? So what I can do is use release.objects.filter and if we wanted to filter by primary key what we need to pass in now is a tuple so I'm going to copy this and we can paste that in there and that is the way we filter with the primary key when it's a composite primary key we pass a tuple in and we get back any relations that match that filter statement. And of course, because a primary key uniquely identifies a record, we should get a query set consisting of one or zero records. And if you expect one back, you can call .get, and that will give you back the model instead of a query set. So composite primary keys are finally available in Django. It's actually the oldest open ticket for the framework, and it's finally been released. But I do want to note a few things about it, so we're going to go to this section here. If we go to the section on composite primary keys and relations, what you'll see here is that relationship fields, including generic relations, do not support composite primary keys. So here's an example. We have a class called foo and it's got a foreign key to an order line table. And that table, if we scroll up here, was defined with a composite primary key, as you can see here. That kind of relationship is not supported at the moment. And the reason for that is because foreign keys cannot currently reference models with composite primary keys. So that's something to note and I'll leave a link to this page below the video as well. Now I want to move on to another topic so I'm going to go back to the release notes. We're going to look very briefly at the simplified over override of the bound field. So prior to version 5.2 overriding the field.getBoundField method was the only option to use a custom bound field. Now Django now supports the following attributes to customise form rendering. So we can do it at the project level, we can set that on the base renderer and the property is bound field class. We can also do it at the form level, in other words it will affect all fields on the form and we can also do it at the field level as well to essentially change the bound field for a single field on the form. Now this gets into the weeds a little bit of Django form handling. If you don't know a bound field is an object that essentially represents a single form field in Django and it's connected to data and it knows how to render itself to HTML. So think of, for example, the label for a form field. It knows about the label and it knows how to render that label to an HTML element. Now, when might you want to override the bound field for a form? One use case of this is if you need custom rendering logic for a specific field. For example, you might want to wrap an input in some extra HTML. You might want to add some dynamic CSS classes or you might want to render a tooltip conditionally. All of these kind of things can be controlled or can be handled by subclassing the bound field. Now if we look at this example here, we define a class called custom bound field and it overrides the CSS classes method of the forms.boundField object and it's taking the default result from that class and it's also adding the self.custom class to the classes that are part of that bound field. So it gives you a way to set extra classes on your content and we're going to look at an example of that here and this is being set at the form level. So the bound field class is set as a property on the form and it's being set to that class here. We're going to do something similar now, so let's go to VS Code and I'm in the base.html template here where we're loading up Tailwind CSS and what we're going to do is go to forms.py and at the moment I have this simple contact form here and I'm going to start the Django development server and if you look at this form here you can see it does appear on the UI and this is looking really bad but we're going to try and fix it a little bit using a custom bound field. Now I'm going to go to the documentation and we're going to copy this custom bound field class here and let's bring that into forms.py and at the top we can paste that in and we also need to import this bound field object and that comes from django.forms.boundField so we'll import that and we're going to change the custom class to something from Tailwind CSS so let's give it a background and I'm going to use background slate 200. Now the way we can override the bound field, the default one, is to take the name of this class here and if we want to do it on the form level and affect all of these fields, we're going to set the bound field class property on the form to the class that we defined above. So let's save that and we're going to go back to the page now and I'm going to refresh this page and we're going to see now that each field has a background slate 200 colour. So it's important to know that the bound field is added at the field level. So each one of these fields, if we look at the DOM here, I'm going to inspect the DOM, we can see that there's a div surrounding each field with a class of background slate 200. So that's what's going to happen if you subclass bound field and you add some custom classes here and override the CSS classes method. 
and we're essentially appending any custom classes here to the result and then returning that to be added to the container around the inputs. Now we can add any number here, for example, if I wanted to add some padding and some flex call styles, we could do that and go back to the page. And this time, notice that it looks a bit different. We've got more padding. And because we're using flex call, these are arranged slightly better. And if we go to the documentation for the bound field, which I'm gonna reference here, so we can customize the bound field and there's many more methods to do this. I'll leave a link to this below the video, but one of the ones we can use is, for example, the label tag method. So I'm gonna copy the signature of this method and let's go back to our custom class here. And we're gonna define that method here and I'm gonna fix the indentation. And let's have a look at the logic in the documentation here. So essentially what this is doing is setting some classes on the label tag. So I'm gonna copy this and we're gonna define our own Tailwind classes. And we've pasted that in here and we're gonna change the class that we're adding. So from Tailwind, let's say we're adding text to Excel. So it's gonna make the text larger for the label. And we can also add, for example, font semi bold. So let's save this and go back to our page. When we refresh this page, notice that the label has changed, the text is bigger and now it's semi bold. So this is an example of another method that we can override on a bound field subclass. And that's gonna customize in this case, the label tag. Now what we can do as well is instead of applying this to every single field in the form, we can add this to individual fields instead. So for example, if we only wanted to apply this custom bound field subclass to the name field, what we can do here is add it to that field individually. So after we define the widget, we can then define the bound field class and set it to that one there. So I'm gonna copy the name of this class and we can paste that in there. And if we save this and go back to our web page, we're gonna notice that only the name will have that background color. But first of all, we need to remove this here. So I'm gonna remove that, save this, and that's gonna stop applying that to the entire form. So let's go back here and refresh the page. And notice now that only the name field is using that custom subclass of bound field. So now in Django 5.2, it's much easier to override the bound field for an individual field and also across an entire form. And again, if we go up to the label tag, there's many more things we can do here. We're only really scratching the surface of what a bound field can do. If you're interested in these types of videos, let me know in the comments. But notice as well, we have a label suffix that's set to none. So none is the default value, but we can actually set that here. And let's just say we're hard coding that. If we set it to yo, then go back to the web page here. Let's refresh this and we're gonna see what happens. You can see that appears as a suffix to the label. So lots of customization options. We're gonna leave it there for this video. But before we finish the video, we are gonna look at a couple of extra features of forms that have been added in Django 5.2. So I'm gonna scroll down and we're gonna look at the minor features here. And if there's anything specific about these minor features you want to see, let me know in the comments. What we're gonna look at is some of the form additions. And there's some new widgets for form rendering that have been added. So color input, search input, and tail input. The color input, as you might expect, is for entering colors. The search input is for search queries. And the tail input is for entering telephone numbers. And these render as specific input types. For example, type of tail here for the telephone, type of search for the search input, and for the color input that has a type of color. So what I want to do is go back to forms.py here and what we're gonna do is add those to the contact form just for demonstration purposes. So I'm gonna paste these in here. So we've added a color field here, it's a car field, but the widget is set to a forms.color input and the same for the search field here, it's got a forms.search input and for the telephone number, we have a forms.tail input. These widgets are all added in Django 5.2, so let's now save this and we can have a look at how these render. So let's refresh this page and notice at the bottom we have these here. So the color input allows you to easily change and define colors in a form. And the other two look a bit weird, but what I'm gonna do is remove the default styling from Tailwind CSS. So if we go to base.html and comment that out, that's gonna remove all the Tailwind styles. And now you can see we have simple looking text inputs. And we can enter search queries here and we can also enter telephone numbers. And these behave very similarly to input of type text. But if we look under the hood here, they have different types. This one's got a telephone type and the one above it here has a search type. Now that's good for semantic reasons if you're representing a search query or if you're representing a telephone number in your forms. And it can also help with the display on certain devices. For example, if you're on a mobile phone, an input of type tell, that could trigger or present a custom keyboard that's optimized for entering telephone numbers. So these are also all new in Django 5.2 and these are pretty cool if you're using things like colors for data submission. Now a couple of final things to note, one of them is pretty easy to point out. When we start the Django development server, we now get this warning appearing on the terminal. 
and that tells us that it's a development server, don't use it in a production setting and you should use a production WSGI or ASGI server instead. So a simple warning, but that's now been added to the terminal when we run the Django server. And there's another quite interesting one I saw as well. So if we go down to the templates section here, this new simple block tag decorator, that enables the creation of simple block tags which can accept and use a section of the template. So let's have a look at this briefly. Basically when we need to pass in a section of a rendered template into a custom template tag, Django now provides this helper function to accomplish this. And it's similar to the simple tag decorator. And it also accepts a custom tag function, but that function has an additional content argument. And that argument contains the rendered content as defined inside the tag. And that allows dynamic template sections to be easily incorporated into custom tags. Now what this means here, if we look at this definition, we have register.simpleBlockTag, that's a decorator, and that's got a function called chart, and now it accepts an argument called content. And what this is doing is returning the render chart function, which you're importing from some kind of module, and you're passing the source in there as the content. Now the important part of this is basically that we can embed content here. And this is similar to how things like React work with children. So this could be a step forward for Django in terms of creating components. We can actually pass dynamically rendered content here inside the template tag. And we can then access that content as an argument to the function and then use that within the body. I'm interested in maybe trying to make a video on this. If you're interested, let me know. But I think that opens up some possibilities for Django in terms of building components that have children and those children can be dynamically rendered pieces of HTML or anything else that you can then accept in the function and use however you want. So that's all for this video on Django 5.2. It's a new release for Django, and I think it's added some interesting features. And as I said at the start, we did a video on Django 5.1 release. If you're interested in me doing this every time there's a release, let me know in the comments. And if you found this content useful, check out our coffee page and subscribe to the channel for more updates on Django and other technologies. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.